welcome back. We are rapidly running to the end of this. We're in class eight. So we have this class and two more, and we will have the full overview of Dr. Owen's, again, framework of the creation gospel, because the depth you're going to mine will be much greater than this framework. But I wanted you to have a handle on at least seeing the big picture. So we're going to pick up with the seven assemblies in Revelation. Um, and I know that's usually the one everybody wants to get to. Uh, well, we Again, we're going to we're going to back up a little bit and we're going to think about all the layers that we have hopefully been adding to our charts and we're starting to build those layers up. Um, Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 says, Wisdom has built her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. Forsake folly and live and proceed in the way, the Derek, of understanding. So I'm going to highlight that hewn out her seven pillars. So if we think about a pillar, um, Psalm 75, 2 through 3 says, When I select an appointed time, there's our Moed, it is I who judge with equity. The earth and all who dwell in it melt. It is I who have firmly set its pillars. So if we think of the Moedim that we just got done over with the overview, think of them like pillars and they stand. So as we've been building these layers up, we've actually been building seven pillars that stand. And so if we remember just briefly, I didn't get into a lot of the Hebrew, but the Ad that represented eternity and the Moed with that festival, the means by which we reach eternity. There's also Adi, which is the jewelry or ornaments. There's Edut, which we briefly touched on with Acts, that testimony or witness. And then Ida or Adat. Well, there's your congregation or assembly. So your many translations will often say the churches. Wow, it was a congregation. It was an assembly. And so that is a better word for the churches because it kind of holds right in to uh, how we have just been studying. It stands. The assemblies stand. Uh, and the word church, I don't believe, was really around at that time. It really was a congregation or an assembly. So Dr. Owen says that's a better word to use maybe than churches. Um, and so the messages to the seven assemblies stand, just like the pillars, just like our seven branch menorah that has stood here the whole time that we have been studying this. It's that tree planted by water, deeply rooted, eternal, and unmovable. And as we stand, we help light the way, right, on that path so people can see how to follow it. And again, now we really kind of, you can go in a lots of directions when you get to the letters to the assemblies. So again, there are many other sources out there. I'm just looking at, again, the thematic connection, and I'm relating it mostly to that wicked lamp because Yeshua writes a memo to each of these assemblies, and he gives them some things to work on. So again, if we think about the refining process and how we relate them back to all that we have been learning, we start to see how the wicked lamp really can apply when we get to the assemblies and how walking on this path and um, going through the dress rehearsals of the feast can refine that wicked lamp. And so that's how I am going to focus on these assemblies. And again, for review, Proverbs 20, 20 through 7, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of his being. Uh, and then again, we talked about the eye being clear, right, from Luke 11. And watch out that that light in you is not darkness. So if we think about that wicked lamp, it starts out with haughty eyes, right? That prideful look. And the first thing that does, it separates you. If you think about that, I'm not backing down, right? You're already separated. You're not humble. You're proud. And then there's a lying tongue. So we're moving from our eyes, then we're moving to our mouth and what it's uttering. And then we move to hands that shed innocent blood. And if you think too about, again, being on the phone and typing something behind a screen, it's a little bit of anonymity there that you might say some things with your fingers that maybe your lips and your mouth wouldn't really say, but you will with your fingers. And so you're shedding innocent blood. And then you think about that heart, of course, it's going to be that central stem because everything is flowing out of it. And the wicked lamp, the heart, it's devising wicked plans. And then you think about the feet that are running rapidly to evil. So, and then we get to a false witness uttering lies. So now we've moved, if you notice, from 
eyes and tongue and hands and heart and feet. Now we're a whole person. Day six, it's who you are, right? It's the sixth day. And then what do you do? You're separating brothers. And so that is a very uh, deep progression, moving from individual parts to being who you are. And so, of course, we want to stop it at the pride at level if we can. And that's usually the first thing that rises up, at least it is with me. I start to get that little sassy pants attitude and I think, oh, where did that come from? And I have to kind of simmer down a little bit. Maybe you can relate. And so when we think about Yeshua, he is the lamp. Revelation 1, 13 through 16 and verse 20 says, And in the middle of the lampstand, I saw one like a son of man. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, and then Revelation 21, 23 says, And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So again, you see, even from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you see that chiastic structure. You see that mirrored image. And now we see the Lamb that was slain from the beginning of the world, from the foundation of the world. Here he is at the end, and he is the Lamb, is the Lamb at the end. And there's no need then for the sun or the moon. And so we will start with Ephesus on that first branch. And I'm going to read the passage. And I want you to see if you hear any, again, key words, anything you think that would help layer some of the, the pieces that we have already put together. So it says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot endure evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary yet you do have this that you hate the deeds of nicolaitans which i also hate and then it says but i have this against you that you have left your first love Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So again, you can see some parallels, I hope from that. And if we just take a real quick, and I mean real quick, and I just did a, a little searching in some books to pull out some thematic connections. But if we think about Ephesus in general, it means permitted. So again, let's think about what we know from the Exodus. How many times did uh, Pharaoh not permit them to go? How many times did they have to go ask him, right? And then also think about darkness, everywhere, but light was, was permitted in Goshen. So you think about that back and forth, what was permitted and what was allowed. Um, and then the geography, it was 60 miles from Patmos, which if you know, John was exiled on Patmos when he had this revelation. Um, and then Ephesus was the capital and major city of the Roman province of Asia. Culturally, it had one of the greatest theaters and the temple of Diana or Artemis, a fertility god. And then commerce, it was the world capital of the slave trade. So when you think about bondage and slavery, it takes you right back to Egypt. And so it's very interesting. Again, Dr. Owen tells us that it's written in memo form. So the believers, and it was written to believers, they knew what John was talking about. And of course, they could see these things right before them every day. So Hold those thematic connections when you think about Exodus 1, 13 through 14. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. 
and all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. So again, you hear some words and repetition. That's for a reason. Um, and so the conditions were very much the same in Ephesus. And so you think about Ephesus and Passover, right? He knows their deeds, their toil, and their perseverance. They were put to the test, but they endured for his name's sake. They had not grown weary. Um, so we remember that passion, right? But they had left their first love. Um, Dr. Owen says the Ephesians needed to separate light and darkness to return to his love. And it would require, of course, the spirit of wisdom. So we remember, right? It's following that first love wherever. And he tells them, you've left that. Go back to your first love. Um, and Dr. Owen asked us to consider Constantine's Creed, um, which you can do some more searching on that because I'm trying to keep it at the surface level. But it was basically the official departure of the church from the Hebrews. And they told them to renounce customs and rites and legalisms and unleavened breads and sacrifices and prayers, um, purifications, um, Sabbaths and new moans. Well, that pretty much sounds like you're going to give up your whole culture, right? You're going to give up the word and you're going to follow me. And so they had left that first love. She asked us to consider that. Would that be what they did? Um, Jeremiah 2, 2 through 3 says, Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals. You're following after me in the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his harvest. They left that. They forgot that. And so he's reminding them, come back to where you're at. And so, again, if you get that, that pride that sticks up, you have to remember to come back to a little humbleness and come back to where you're at, that first love. And just, again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So they go hand in hand. You put yourself in proper place and you think, I need to think about whom I am standing before and have a little more reverence, a little more humbleness in my place. And so that is just one way, of course, to think about that and the thematic connections to make it more applicable, of course. And then please, by all means, do more further study um, in the context of everything that's going on because you're going to find so many other layers. But if we move on to Smyrna, um, it says the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. Um, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. There are no unclean works, as Dr. Owen calls them. There's nothing mentioned. The commands, he says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. You see some of those thematic connections that we've been making? We think about Smyrna. You hear the word myrrh in it. Well, that's a burial spice, right? He's in the tomb, unleavened bread. It's 40 miles due north of Ephesus. So keep moving around um, in, on the map. Culturally, they had a stadium, they had a library, a public theater. They had temples to Aphrodite and Apollo and Zeus, among others. Um, but they were a great trade city that was rich in beauty. And he tells them they are rich. Um, and so we see some thematic connections there when we think about unleavened bread. He says, don't fear what you're about to suffer, right? He knows what's coming on day three, right? I know your tribulation. You will be tested, but you're rich. There's going to be life on the other side of the separation. So there's your understanding that Bina, yes, there's a separation for a reason, for the conditions for life, okay? So that's separating. So the days of unleavened bread, or that dividing line, Dr. Owen tells us, between man and beast. Are we going to obey? Are we going to pull out that junk and the leaven that does not belong? Right? And so, again, we think about, they, they mentioned the synagogue of Satan, that lying tongue, if you think about that. Uh, Dr. Owen says a simple way to think about the synagogue of Satan is just somebody misrepresenting Scripture. You know, if you think about the serpent, he twists and he turns and he makes it say what he wants it to say. So unleavened bread, it's not like that. You pull all of that 
sin and leaven out. Um, and you also, if you think about Matthew 3, 7 through 8, um, John was talking. He said, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So that seems like pretty harsh language in our term. He called him a brood of vipers. Well, in context, was he saying, you're twisting scripture, right? You're not representing it well, but he doesn't cast them out either. What does he say? Okay, then bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you have finally figured out the way, then you better bear some fruit that, dis- that exhibits that, right? And if you think about unleavened bread, again, just a little more Hebrew, Matzot, you probably recognize that, or matzah, that's the unleavened bread. But mitzvot, it's the commandment, right? And we think about, I am the bread of life. And eating his words, what are we feeding on every day? Are we feeding on the mitzvah and the mitzvot? And so you can think about that duality between unleavened bread and the bread of life. Can he be the unleavened bread? And can he also be the fluffy, rich challah bread that has leaven in it. Because most every other day of the year, you can have leavened bread. How can he be both? Right? And then if we think about testing, um, I don't know about you. I am a product of the public school system. And I really just looked at tests as something that I could memorize quickly and throw it back on the paper and walk away and never really ponder it ever again. So again, that's why I like this material because it sinks into your heart and testing was for a purpose. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 3 says, all the commandments that I'm commanding you today, shall you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you testing you to know what's in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry, but he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So I hope you see some connections when you read that. Um, And so there's a reason for that wilderness to test your heart. It's a refining process. And Smyrna, they didn't have any exhortations for them. They were, they were okay. There was nothing there, if you think about that um, separation. So here, maybe it was good. They pulled out the sin necessary, that they did the work of being um, unleavened bread. And so you think, again, let's move on to Pergamum. Um, and let's read the memo real quick. The one who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, which means like the father, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. You have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who keep teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit acts of immorality, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, or else I'm coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcome, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. So if we think about Pergamum, it means height or elevation. So again, you think about that first fruits and elevating that barley um, harvest um, for the first fruits. And then we think Pergamum was the center for paganism and emperor worship. It was home to one of the largest libraries, second only to Alexandria. And it had shrines to Zeus and Athena and Asclepios, among others. Um, And their location permitted much trade, but they were well known um, besides that. And so then you think, again, I know where you dwell. And think about the first fruits of barley. You hold fast my name. You didn't deny my faith. You've removed the stumbling blocks. So there will be a hidden manna and a white stone with a new name. So there's some first fruits there. 
But that spirit of counsel, right? It's teaching Torah. It's bearing good fruit. Um, but in exhortation, the Pergamum assembly is promised hidden manna for overcoming. So Dr. Owain tells us that overcoming through obedience at this stage of the Moedim carries the promise of hiding, right? During the covered and hidden days of the fall feast. So again, we think about that chiastic structure. But we remember that wicked lamp and those, the, the council, right? And we, they mentioned Balaam and Balak and the Nicolaitans, and they were stumbling blocks. Um, so their culture around them, uh, they were hands shedding innocent blood, their mouths, they're talking. They were um, eating things sacrificed to idols. They were committing acts of immorality. So there was basically a lot of assimilation with the culture. So we get to where you're going to make that turning point here. If you're assimilating with the culture, that's going to be a problem. Are you going to be able to endure to the end? Right? And so we think about that judgment of the spirit of counsel. It didn't change Pharaoh's heart. He stuck with his bride, right? Um, he might have had some remorse every now and then, but the resentment of his hard heart prevented that true repentance, Dr. Elwain tells us. And so we can see those thematic connections of the barley um, and then symbolizing the fires of death and hell, that first death, and then waving or elevation of the sheaves representing, of course, the spirit of resurrection, our Messiah. Um, and so we see some thematic connections there as well. So when we move to Thyatira, uh, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. Your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Do you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent. She does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. So he who overcomes um, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations." He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So again, I hope you heard some key words there, places you could anchor them. But Thyatira means odor of affliction. So if, again, if you think about that, that smell and the take us all the way back to the salmon and that aroma and being able to move in the right direction. And here, they were following Jezebel. They were worshiping the creator or the creation and not the creator. So it was the smallest and the least important town, ironically enough, and it was deeply rooted in sun worship. So again, you see how they were following the creation. They got enamored with that. So when we look and we see God in his creation, we don't stop to worship the creation. We're thankful for it, but we reflect him. It's his design. And it points us right back to the creator. Um, the culture in Thyatira, they had trade guilds and it demanded membership, um, but their practices were anything holy. So are you going to exchange your ideals for the culture? Um, and it was known for its wool trade and purple dye. So again, we think about Shavuot. Right? And you think about that time in between day three and day four and counting up to that time period. Um, he who overcomes, like you have to keep his deeds, it says, I will give you authority over the nations and I will give him the morning star. So it's that balance, walking in the word and walking in the spirit. It's that boundary marker, right? But if we think about the wicked lamp, it's a heart that's devising wicked plans. Um, Romans 1, 20 through 25 says, For since the creation of the world, hyperlink, 
His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and of crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshiped the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So do you hear Paul's words there? Does it give you a place to anchor it and start to build those layers up? Watch where your heart leads you. Um, And then if we think about the Ruach, that spirit, that breath, the Holy Spirit, right? Um, And then that sense of smell and the odor of affliction. May it be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And so if you do a, a little word study with the spirit, it's the Ruach. But the verb is breathe, it's riak. And so the first mention of that, um, it talks about, and in the, in the definition is to breathe, to blow, especially with the nostrils, right? To smell with pleasure. So to delight in that. And the first mention is Genesis 8, 21. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. So it's in relation to the ark. The ark, they got out. Noah created um, a a sacrifice and that smell was pleasing to the Lord. But the second mention was Genesis 27, 27. And he came close and kissed him. And when he smelled the smell of his garment, he blessed him. And he said, see, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. So that's Isaac. And smelling, he used his sense of smell in order to recognize who he thought was Esau, what was really Jacob. But this is where looking up these words is very important because when I started following that, all of a sudden I'm going through first mention, complete mention, and I get to Isaiah 11, three through four. So we know Isaiah one through two because we just studied that with the spirit. But right after we learn about the spirit, it says, and he will delight That word is the same word for smell. But here, they call it delight. It says, He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath, his lips, he will slay the wicked. So again, you think about that fragrance. That's how he's going to discern with his smell. He's going to smell um, and he's not going to judge. He's going to judge rightly. So I just thought that was absolutely fascinating that they changed the word to delight. Um, And then you think about Ephesians 5, 1, 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So again, you put those pieces together. What is your heart leading you? Where is that? Is it wicked or is it pure? And how will you know? Because we can't always trust what our eyes see, what our ears hear, especially on the internet these days and all of the fancy tools that they have. There's lots of imitations online. You have to trust with the sense that's kind of outside of our physical senses. We have to start to develop that spiritual sense. And I think starts with smell. So I hope that you spend some time playing in the word again and maybe look up some of those verses and see where it leads you. And we'll come back for class nine.